Okay. To, uh, I'm just going to bring up the, there we go, the entire slide. To just kick this off, I thought I would start, and to give us all a common vocabulary, I thought I would just start by walking us through the main uh, two or three prohibitions within the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, that, um, that form the basis for you know, prosecutions or civil litigation that focuses on off-label promotional activity. So the first one uh, are the misbranding provisions in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The basic prohibition is uh, against introducing into interstate commerce any drug that is adulterated or misbranded. Uh, so what is misbranded? Um, under the FDCA, a drug is misbranded if it's labeling any one of three things. Doesn't bear adequate directions for use, fails to include adequate warnings, or is false or misleading in any particular. What is important to recognize here is that the FDA has defined labeling to be very broad. Uh, it is not just what you would traditionally view as the label that's attached to the pharmaceutical drug product itself. It can include any other written or printed or graphic material that's accompanying the, ar the drug article. Um, and by accompanying the article, it means that it's anything that would supplement or explain the product in connection with its distribution. Um, and things that can count as labeling include brochures or booklets, uh, detailing pieces that sales representatives might prepare or leave, um, even things like calendars, film strips, sound recordings, um, reprints, exhibits. Um, if these relate to the drug and are distributed with the drug um, to supplement or explain uh, the product, then they can be considered labeling under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. If the label literally contains false statements or, for example, unsubstantiated therapeutic claims, courts have held that that can constitute false or misleading labeling that could trigger a misbranding violation. But labeling also has to bear adequate directions for um, the product's intended use. And this is where the misbranding violation can actually extend out and, and become quite potentially broad. Intended use is determined by a manufacturer's objective intent. And intent can be shown by the circumstances that surround the distribution of the article. So those circumstances are not limited necessarily to written material or audio or visual material that's distributed with the drug. Um, therefore, for example, off-label promotional statements, oral statements um, by a sales representative can be viewed as evidence of an intended use of the product that's not included within the improved labeling and that therefore could potentially uh, form the basis for a misbranding charge. The second main uh, piece of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that is used to pursue off-label promotion are the um, prohibitions on distributing unapproved new drugs in interstate commerce. Um, the basic statutory prohibition is in the first bullet. Um, you know, any person, including a drug company, is prohibited from introducing or delivering for introduction into interstate commerce any new drug unless an approval of an application is effective. Um, approval is based on whether a drug is deemed safe and effective for all the uses set forth in the labeling. Uh, think back to the definition of labeling we just discussed. Um, the key here is unlike the misbranding charge, whether a drug will be considered a new drug is dependent on the written labeling. So if uh, a claim that off-label promotion violates the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is going to be pursued under the new drug provisions, the focus of the case is going to be on the content of the labeling, not necessarily on the conduct oral statements that are made surrounding the distribution of the drug. Um, the focus here is on whether the labeling uh, talks about conditions that are recommended or suggested or prescribed, but that are not contained within the labeling that's approved by the, by the FDA. So that's the unapproved new drug theory. The final thing that I'd just like to mention is that while the misbranding and the unapproved new drug provisions absolutely limit um, the types of promotional claims that can be made for drugs. Um, they don't ban all promotional statements that aren't explicitly set forth in the labeling of the drug. Um, the focus of both the misbranding and the new drug provisions is on whether a uh, use that's being promoted is a new use. Um, it is certainly possible that you can, a company could make promotional claims that aren't explicitly in the label, but that are still consistent with the use that's described by the label, and these can be okay. Um, for example, if you have a claim about the effectiveness of the drug um, in a particular subpatient population, if that claim is consistent with the labeling 
and isn't otherwise explicitly excluded by what's in the labeling. And it's not a new use of the drug. It can be made. As you can imagine, drawing the lines in that area can be very difficult um, to do, but, it, but, it, but it's out there. And then the last thing I'll mention is that for both of these provisions, the misbranding and the unapproved new drug provisions, um, these trigger criminal penalties. Um, introducing a misbranded or unapproved new drug into interstate commerce is a crime. Um, there are both misdemeanor and felony provisions within the uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And for the misdemeanor, um, it's a strict liability uh, crime. For the felony, uh, the government would have to prove an intent to defraud or uh, mislead. There are certain exceptions and safe harbors that FDA has recognized that do permit pharmaceutical companies to um, communicate about off-label uses of drugs that are, have been approved already for, for an on-label use. And uh, these are the four main categories of uh, communications that can be permitted under appropriate circumstances. Uh, the first is scientific exchange, and this exception is rooted in a regulation that we can all discuss a little bit more later. Uh, subject to certain limitations, manufacturers can provide scientific information about new drugs or new uses of approved drugs. Um, they can't represent that a drug is safe and effective for an unapproved use in a promotional context. There's also an unsolicited request exception. Um, manufacturers, if they receive an unsolicited request for information about an unapproved use of an approved drug, they're permitted to respond with um, specific, balanced scientific information in response to that request. But a manufacturer can't um, you know, engage in a conversation that's designed to solicit those types of requests. Um, the third category is support for continuing medical education. Um, in guidance issued in late 1997, FDA recognized that manufacturers can provide content and financial support for continuing medical education. Um, but there's obviously concern that continuing medical education will be turned into a promotional vehicle. And so the emphasis in the guidance is on um, ensuring that there is independence of the CME from substantive influence of the pharmaceutical manufacturer. So that the CME is, it, you know, re really remains an independent medical education forum and it doesn't become a vehicle for promotion of the particular product. And finally, medical journal articles and reference texts. Um, the rules governing these uh, these types of materials um, have really been in flux for a number of years. Um, FDA initially proposed some guidelines um, restricting their dissemination um, and setting conditions uh, within which the dissemination could occur um, in the early 1990s. Uh, this triggered litigation by the Washington Legal Foundation asserting First Amendment uh, grounds uh, for challenging uh, these restrictions. And uh, those questions were litigated but not fully resolved uh, because Eventually, on appeal at oral argument, the government made some representations that essentially mooted out the specific issue um, that was at issue in that case. Uh, Congress passed a law, um, the FDAMA, um, which uh, provided conditions under which these types of materials could be provided, and this law was put into effect in the late 90s, but then expired by its own terms in 2006. So it no longer um, is in place. And then the latest. Uh, piece in this is in January of this year, guidance from FDA on good reprint practices um, issued. Uh, and it uh, provides, again, criteria uh, that manufacturers, that, that FDA recommends manufacturers follow if they want to distribute these types of materials. Uh, but this doesn't have the force of regulation or law. In fact, it almost, it begins with what looks an awful lot to me like a black box warning that we're used to seeing in connection with drug, uh, with, with, with drug labels that says uh, straight up that the guidance document doesn't confer or create any rights um, and doesn't operate to bind FDA or the public. So the way FDA has chosen to provide guidance in this area is to indicate what its current thinking is, um, but not to go through the normal process of creating binding regulations that would have the force of law.